Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today I am broadcasting to you from the great state of Wyoming. I'm going on a, a business trip for the for actually a good little while, and so I'm, I'm not going to be back home for a while, but hey, videos fortunately can be made just about anywhere. I can't always upload them anywhere, but they can usually be made just about anywhere, so I'll still be able to do a lot of the things that I normally do, fortunately. Um, you guys get a look at a lot of hotel uh, rooms when you guys watch my channel because it's like a different hotel room almost every time. Awesome. But um, as to the topic for today, we're going to be continuing the review of Leighton Flowers' uh, classroom session entitled Tip Th Tiptoeing Through Tulip. For some reason, I can never say it right. But uh, we're going to be continuing that series, and uh, we are today getting to the part on unconditional election. Before I get to that, though, I wanted to go ahead and review some of the important things that we've already kind of discovered in reviewing this. Um, at the beginning, we already said, hey, you know, there's a lot uh, that we would agree with the traditional Southern Baptists on. You know, regarding a lot of the core tenets of the faith, we'd, we'd all be Trinitarians. We would all be against hyper-Calvinism, you know, both Leighton Flowers and myself. And other, a lot of other people involved in this would be against that as well, except for, of course, the hyper-Calvinists. Um, we would be against uh, Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism and things like that. We would, you know, affirm the full deity of Christ, doctrine of the Trinity, if I, ever, if I already haven't mentioned that. Um, a lot of the basics of Protestant theology, maybe not necessarily the five doctrines of grace, but at least the five pillars uh, we would agree on. And no, these are not the five pillars of Islam. It's the five pillars of Protestant theology, like sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, um, soli and dio gloria, uh, solo Cristo. All of those we would agree on. You know, um, it's on this particular aspect of soteriology that we disagree. And because we agree on those other things, I have no problem calling um, Leighton Flowers a brother in the Lord. That's not my concern. My concern isn't that he's unsaved. My concern is that he's very inconsistent in his handling of Scripture. And that's what I'm trying to address in these kinds of things. Um, the fact that he disagrees with me on soteriology in and of itself really isn't that big of a deal to me. And yes, it's a big deal, but in and of itself... It really isn't. The bigger issue to me is how are you treating scripture? And so when we've gone through his material so far, we've just discussed a lot of the common errors that he seems to make, a lot of the common fallacies that he seems to succumb to. And these include things like playing with definitions. Leighton Flowers loves to do this, where he loves to, to take a given definition, turn it on its head, say, well, it's not really this, it's really this over here, and basically rearrange everything. And in so much as it has to do with his own system, I don't really mind. It's his own thing. But when he takes our terms, and I'm speaking you know, from the Calvinistic perspective, when he takes our firms and redefines them and says that they're not clear enough, when in fact throughout history they've been very clear on what they believe. Um, you know, We have the confessions and the great creeds and those kinds of things and statements of faith and lots of documentation uh, that Calvinists have produced. It's not exactly like we're vague on these things. Um, but he likes to go through and mess with the definitions uh, regardless of that fact, and that is not a sign of good exegetical prowess. Um, it usually just does a whole lot more to confuse things than it does to actually get to the meat and potatoes of what's being said. And then when we actually get into the text themselves, the text of the Bible, his t he makes two very, very, very common errors. So one, on the outside of the Bible, he likes to play around with definitions a lot. But when it comes to actually reading from the text, and exegeting the text, drawing out from the text what is there and applying a hermeneutical method to it, there are two very common errors that he makes. One of them is the error of avoidance. That is, there's these different things that are going on, these different things that are in contest. And he doesn't go to passages that have those different items together, the ones that are being contested. Instead, he very frequently goes off in different directions. He goes to texts that don't happen to deal with all of the germane parts together. And we talked about that last time with, say, Acts, uh, what is that, 1348, where we talk about the word being given. And Leighton Flowers has said, you know, well, the giving of uh, the word is sufficient for people to, to turn to God, right? And he lists many instances, you know, where you know, the word of God is said to be uh, powerful. It's the power of God until salvation and things like that. And 
great, fine, wonderful. I, I don't disagree with any of those verses, of course. But the question is, how does the presentation of the Word of God deal with the election of God? And you need to have a context that actually deals with how those two things interact. And one of those cases is in Acts uh, 13, 48, where the Word of God is presented, but the deciding factor in who believes and who doesn't is the appointment of God. It says that those who were appointed believed. It doesn't say that those who decided to respond to the message believed. Now, obviously, they would have to decide to respond to the message. We're not denying that people are going to respond. But the question is, why did they respond? Why did they have that faith? Acts 13.48 is really clear that it wasn't just the presentation of the gospel alone. It was the presentation of the gospel along with the appointment of God. He didn't address that. He didn't bring that up. He didn't... Um, deal with the fact that that is relevant. He instead avoided that text that deals with all those different parts and together, the election of God, the presentation of the word, whether or not people believe. That's one of the texts that has all of the different items together. There's also a germane passage in John chapter 8 that I talked about. He doesn't go to those places. He avoids the places that deal with everything together and there's two basic reasons why. Either he knows that those uh, places would refute his position, and if he's doing that, it's just blanket dishonesty, and I really hope that is not the case. Um, people have had to have brought this up uh, to him before, but still, hold out hope. Maybe it's maybe it's the other uh, case, and the other case would be that it is maybe a simple oversight. Um, he didn't really put two and two together and think, oh, this is where you know the those who were opposed to me. You know, what they're uh, saying uh, would come into play here, and I need to be able to deal with that. Maybe it is just simply not thinking of it, but given that this has been out for a while, and he seems to make these same arguments time and time again, and I know other people have reviewed this stuff and brought up similar concerns, it seems like he's avoiding it on purpose, and that has me greatly concerned, because that means that not only is there, there the air of avoidance, but it's the air of avoidance motivated essentially by dishonesty and that is really concerning okay i'm not trying to be overly mean about it or anything like that but i am genu genuinely concerned about that if you can avoid a particular text of scripture intentionally because you essentially don't like what it has to say then your view of scripture as a whole is going to be really unbalanced and while in this particular area it might not affect his salvation overall in other areas that people take what he's doing here and we're consistent throughout the Bible of saying, well, you can avoid things you don't like and you don't want to have to deal with, well, then you undermine a lot of other doctrines that he and I would agree on. That would undermine the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ. It would undermine substitutionary atonement, all kinds of things. That's a really dangerous error, the error of avoidance. The easiest way to pervert the Bible is to avoid certain parts of the Bible. And then the other error that he very much so loves unfortunately, is the parable error. And that is where you take something that is allegorical and you take the details of that allegory and you use them as a foundation for doctrine and theology. And we've said this before, you can't do that with allegory. If you were to try to do that with allegory, you'd wind up with positions that would contradict pretty much anything you want, depending on where, how far you want to press those details. You can contradict any position that's out there. And in the case of Dr. Leighton Flowers, he is once saved, always saved. He's a Southern Baptist and a traditionalist Southern Baptist. And so there are particular um, interpretations of uh, given parables that if you look at the details hard enough, you can really try to circumvent those. And um, even one of his favorite parables that we talked about last time in Luke 15, um, it never mentions any kind of substitutionary uh, work that has to be done on the part of the prodigal son. And if you were to press on that detail, you can make an argument that substitutionary atonement isn't necessary. We have Jesus Victor instead of the substitutionary atonement uh, view of what Christ did on the cross. And that puts him outside of the realm of Protestant orthodoxy. If he were to go that far, I'm not saying that he ever would. But if you were to be consistent in how he's interpreting parables uh, based on, you know, little details here and there and 
and pressing on particular details, not recognizing that every parable has only one main point. So like, actually, all that applies to all of scripture. Every scripture only has one main point, lest the thing become absolutely useless. Um, but in particular with parables, it's important because if you press on details, you know, any which way you want, you can create anything, any undermine pretty much every doctrine the Bible has to offer in that regard. So it's not a consistent way to deal with the text. Um, the way that Christians have discovered throughout history, not just not just the the reform movement that came out of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, but even Christians before that recognized that if you press on the details of parables, um, you're going to wind up with a lot of wacky things. And this is something that goes back all the way back to the beginning with the, the Gnostics, who were largely second century, but they existed afterwards, and there's kind of some pre-Gnostic uh, ideas and thoughts that show up before the second century as well, that even uh, the apostles in the New Testament wind up having to deal with. Um, but, but yeah, it's nothing new, this idea of taking a parable and interpreting it this way that people very early on realized that the parables are not meant to stand alone. There's a broader context. It only has one core meaning. And you never interpret, use the ambiguous passages, which is what allegory is. It's not meant to get at things straight. It's meant to be slantwise. You never use the ambiguous to define the clear. You use the clear to define the ambiguous. That is a well-tried historical method of interpretation. But Professor Layton Flowers ignores that, uh, especially in this lecture. And he's done it in other cases as well. All right, so... That's a review of a lot of the major things that we've discussed so far and hope people understand why we're doing this is so that we can talk about that methodology more than anything else. Okay, How do you handle the Word of God in a manner that is respectful and honest and consistent across the board that would allow you to defend any of the core doctrines of the faith? It's not a matter of do you have the five points right. It's a matter of can you deal with the Bible as a whole right? That's what's at stake here. Okay. And that's why I'm bringing this up. Okay, Dr. Leighton Flowers in and of himself seems like a nice enough guy, at least in certain aspects, when it doesn't come to this. You know, uh, here though, there are some really major issues, and that's why we're talking about it. All right, so taking up enough time with that, let's go ahead and get into this. And yes, I'm going to be playing this a little bit fast. I actually slowed it down just a little bit. I brought it to 1.25 speed instead of 1.5. But still, it'll probably sound a little chipmunkish. No, that is not how Leighton Flowers talks. That's that's just because it spins better. All right. The next one is the U called unconditional election. Now, this particular point can get really hairy and really confusing really fast. So, um, and we're doing okay on time, hopefully. All right. First of all, I don't like this terminology, and some Calvinists don't either, because it it kind of the word election makes it sound like there's only one choice God ever makes. The word election is just it just means choice. That's all it means. You elect something, you choose something, okay? But the word election kind of comes across as God's made one choice in all of redemptive history. No. Okay, God's made many choices, okay? And he makes many choices in order to fulfill his redemptive plan. All right. Um, first thing that I wanted to address is the simple fact that Leighton Flowers doesn't really take the time to really define what unconditional election is from the Calvinistic viewpoint. He's setting these up, you know, points and counterpoint through all of them, and some of them he takes the time to explain, sometimes not all that well, but a lot of them he takes the time to explain with, but unconditional election he really doesn't take the time to explain. He uh, pretty much jumps right into explaining uh, the traditional Southern Baptist point of view and not addressing the one that he says that he's basically addressing. And, of course, <laughs> a little bit of a problem uh, with that. You say, I'm, a, I'm addressing unconditional election, but I'm not going to actually tell you what it is. Um, that's not very helpful. This is kind of like the idea of playing with definitions, except he just simply avoids definition altogether on this one. Um, so, let's fill in the gap for him. What is unconditional election from the Calvinistic viewpoint? Um, Cal, uh, from the Calvinistic uh, viewpoint, it of course has to go back to what we discussed last time with total depravity. Total depravity is the Calvinistic doctrine that uh, mankind um, is born with a sinful nature that is totally depraved. It is thoroughly corrupt. 
That's the definition. You can punch it into Google, look it up, and it will tell, uh, tell you that it is a thorough corruption. And of course, that has several implications. One of those implications is that if it is truly a thorough corruption, if it is really total depravity in extent, not necessarily in intensity, but in extent, what that means is that people are not naturally going to um, be drawn to God as God wants um, to be reconciled to them. They're not going to come to God on his terms. It doesn't mean that they won't try to come to God, but they're not going to be coming to God as he wants them to because they're going to be doing it from the sinful nature. They're going to be doing it with impure motives. So there's lots of people who will flat out reject God, but there's also going to be people who are going to come for the wrong motives. They're going to think, you know, getting out of hell sounds really great. I'll join for that. Oh, I pray a little prayer with you and I don't have to go to hell. Great, fine, wonderful. Ticket is punched. I'm going to heaven. I'm good. And then there's other people who do it, um, not even necessarily for eternal reasons, um, but temporally selfish reasons. They don't believe in really religion at all, uh, but they want to have power and influence. And hey, those, those Christian preachers, they seem to be able to control a lot of people, so I'll become one of them. And I can have power and control and influence too. They're not coming to God on his terms. It's not that they don't necessarily come to God at all. There will be a lot of them that don't come to God. But the problem is they're not coming to him as he would desire because everything they do is going to be tainted by that sinful nature, either to a great extent or to a small extent, but it's still going to be tainted by that. And this is something that we all have to deal with, is the fact that all of us who are Christians, there is still a part of us in the back of our mind that we're thinking, you know, I'm really glad I'm a Christian so I don't have to go to hell. It's not coming to God for who he is. That's coming to God because you don't like the alternative. But if we're honest with ourselves, there's still a little part of us, even no matter how small it is, that's like that. And there's part of us who really do like positions of power and influence. Um, and it goes to our heads, whether we intend it to or not. You know, even if we, you know, are trying to be good servants, there's still going to be a part of us that thinks, you know, this is pretty cool. I like that people listen to me. Well, of course, biblical salvation doesn't have anything to do with the fact that people listen to you and those kinds of things. But it's still going to go on in our heads. Those sinful desires, no matter how small or how, how minute, are still going to be there. And what that means is that if this is us coming to God, we're coming to God in an impure way. It's still sinful in his sight. It's still reprehensible in his sight. It is still something that is eternally damnable. So because we're not going to come to God on his terms, no matter what we try to do, even in trying to come to him, there's still going to be those impure motives in the back of our mind. What that means is in order for the a relationship to be reconciled properly, it is God who has to move first. That's what unconditional election is all about. Leighton Flowers goes on to talk about it. You know, election is choice um, and all those kinds of uh, things. And he's right about that. Election is choice. And the question is, who makes the first move? Who makes the first choice? Okay, Calvinists don't believe that we don't make any choices. It's not, you know, God chooses us and nothing happens with us. No, we're going to have to choose God. But the problem, though, is that in our natural selves, we're not going to do that. We have to be changed from the inside out so that we make that uh, kind of a change, so that we actually go in that uh, direction so that we can actually be reconciled to God properly. Because everything that we would do in ourselves is still going to be tainted by that sinful nature, even if it is saying, you know, I put my faith and trust in Jesus so I can get out of hell. I put my faith and trust in Jesus because I like that people listen to me, because I like having the friendship and the community, whatever the case happens to be. And even if it's only part of the motive, it's still a motive, and it's still impure, and it's still reprehensible in God's sight. In and of ourselves, we cannot please God in pure totality. So, it's God who has to move towards us, because we cannot rightly, not saying that we can't move towards him at all, but we cannot rightly move towards him. So there's one key choice that's at play here, and that is, who is it who is ultimately responsible for reconciliation, for true proper reconciliation, and that is God.
everything that we would do that brings us into right relationship in, with God is the result of him doing something in us first. That's what the doctrine of unconditional election is about. God moves first. One primary choice. It's not to say other things aren't happening. And it's not to say that we don't have um, a response that we will give. But there's one ultimate choice, one ultimate cause. And that is that God reaches down and he chooses us. And the unconditional part is that it's not because of anything in us. It's not because of any good thing that you did or any bad thing that you did, any good desire that you had or any bad desire that you had. It's because God chose you with a plan and with a purpose. He chose you. Let's take a look at a text that is germane to that. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. All right, let me highlight it here. I don't know if that helps you guys or not, because sometimes the highlight doesn't always come through all that well, but it does help me. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight it. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And there's lots of contention about this particular verse when it comes to the whole Armenian, Armenian versus traditional Southern Baptist uh, versus Calvinist uh, position on this. A lot of times the Armenians and the traditional Southern Baptists will say, you know, it's God's grace and our faith. You know, by God's grace, through our faith. But grammatically, that actually isn't a viable option. If we look at the verse in the Greek over here, um, there's a really interesting hap thing that happens when it says that this is the gift of God that is not of yourselves. The gift of God, um, you'll notice... Uh, it comes up as being a nominative singular, uh, singular neuter, and the um, uh, this is not of yourselves, that that is not of uh, yourselves, um, that is a nominative singular neuter as well. And normally, when those things, the, normally what would happen with those kinds of descriptors is that they would perfectly match up in that regard to whatever they're describing. So if uh, the gift is the grace, or the gift is just simply uh, the being saved part, what we would expect to see is those things being nominative, singular, neuter, and especially um, at least the neuter um, and those kinds of things. So let's go ahead and look at in the previous sentence. The faith, the faith is feminine. It's not neuter. It doesn't match up. Salvation, it's masculine. It doesn't match up with the neuter either. The grace, it's feminine. It doesn't match up with the neuters either. None of them match it. And so what is happening grammatically is that an ambiguous reference is being used. When it says that this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, the that and the it, that is applying to everything. The grace, the faith, the salvation, all of them are the gift of God. Okay, faith is is a blood-bought gift of God, which means that before we can have faith, God has to give it to us. Okay, that's what scripture says, and it's very plain and it's very clear. Okay, so that's what unconditional election is all about. Yes, we are going to respond uh, to God, but it's because he has given us the gift of faith so that we can respond to him. Because if we respond in our natural selves, our response is always going to be tainted by sin. And frankly, in this mortal life, our Christianity is still going to be tainted by sinful motives. But thankfully, God is proactive in his salvation, and he's also not doing it on the basis of any condition in us. Which means, it's not because you were so good or so bad. It's not because you wanted to do good or you wanted to do bad. It's because God was truly gift-giving. He was truly gracious to us. All right, but um, that actually brings us to another uh, much bigger issue that seems to be an issue for Leighton Flowers in general and a lot of folks when it comes to this debate is that, frankly, when it comes right down to it, people do not like the sovereignty of God. It's not a, it's not a popular doctrine. And the reason why it's not a popular doctrine is because in its biblical context, it's confusing. 
when the doctrine of the biblical doctrine of the sovereignty of God comes up, it's actually really similar to another doctrine that, though is not maybe as controversial, at least among uh, Christians, is still just as confusing. And that is the doctrine of the Trinity. You look through the Bible, and the Bible is really clear that there's only one God. Super clear about that. Take, you know, Isaiah 43.10, for example, no God before me, no God after me, I'm God alone. Um, really, really clear that there's just one God. And yet you look through the Bible and you see it talking about the Father, and it talks about the Son, and it talks about the Holy Spirit, and it calls all of them God. It calls all of them the Lord. And you can find references um, that correlate them back to the one Yahweh God of the Bible. But at the same time, it's not like these are just three different names because they are all very distinct from each other. And they interact with each other in very personal ways. You know, there's the Son who prays to the Father and says, Not my will be done, but your will be done. That is, he has um, within the Godhead his own will. You have the Holy Spirit who can be lied to. You can't lie to a force. You can't lie to a tree. You can't lie to an object. That's something that you can only do with a person. It wouldn't be meaningful to say that you did it to an impersonal force or a tree or a rock or something like that. That is something that you can only do to a person. So all of them are personal, and they're personally interactive with each other. And yet, at the same time, they're all called this one God. That on its face is really, really confusing. And there's lots of people that scratch their head and they look at that and say, well, that's a contradiction. You can't have one being and three persons. It doesn't work. They throw up their hands, say the Bible is lying. It's false. It's not true. It's a contradiction. The Bible is an error. And that's the way that a lot of atheists like to go or, um, or other uh, religions that are far outside of monotheism, things like that. They look at the Bible and say, one being, three persons, got some bad math on that one. That's obviously a contradiction. And then there are other groups that they really want to believe the Bible, but that doesn't make sense to them. And so they come along and they try to think of a way to fit it all together. They try to make it make sense to them. And so they say, well, maybe those three persons are like different faces of God. You know, he's, it's different ways that he interacts, you know, and this is where you get modalism. It's the same God, but in different forms. That's a heresy as well. And then there's other people on the other side who say, well, maybe the Son and the Holy Spirit are kind of like lesser kind of divided out and, de and deities that come about later on. And you get Arianism instead of just simply taking what the text has to say. Where the biblical historical Christian rests, though, is in saying that the Bible didn't get it wrong, that this is something that applies to God, and God is not bound the same way that we are. We are bound such that we are one being, one person. That's a limitation on us. It's wrong to take that assumption, though, that applies to us and apply it to God. Assuming that God is like us is one of the most fundamental problems that people make when interpreting the Bible, and especially when it comes to understanding the Trinity. If you assume that God is like you, one being one person, and you read the Bible, you're either going to wind up reinterpreting it, or you're going to think that it's ludicrous. If you accept, though, that when God describes himself as one being, and yet three persons, you accept that this is God defining himself, saying, this is how I am. It might not make sense to you, but this is how I am. Then what happens is you're subjecting yourself to the text saying, this is God's revelation of himself. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but obviously it does. And a similar thing happens regarding God's sovereignty in the Bible. Okay, just as the Trinity is something that is really hard for the human brain to wrap around, we can see what the text says, one being three persons. But on a personal level, it doesn't make sense to us because that's not our experience. Our experience is one being one person. A similar thing happens with the sovereignty of God. Let's go to uh, a good germane passage here. Let's go to Proverbs. Do, 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 do. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 4. And let's see what the Bible actually has to say about the sovereignty of God. In Proverbs 16 verse 4, it says, The Lord... Uh, Lord Yahweh, when it's all in caps like that, it's a 
a translation of the, the, the uh, Hebrew Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Uh, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. God has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. That one is a strange statement. God made everything with a purpose that will be lived out, and that even includes wicked people and the day um, in which they fall. That's what this is a reference of. Some translations will put it as the, the day of doom or something like that. Um, in the ancient mindset, an evil day was where something bad happened to you. So basically saying he even made the wicked so that they could fall, which is a really weird statement when you think about it. It's saying that God is in control of everything. He made everything for its purpose. That is, everything he made has a purpose and it's going to get lived out even so that the wicked person that he made will wind up coming to doom, to an evil day. And this is where people, they sit back and they look at this and say, well, if I had a purpose for everything and I was able to guarantee that all of my purposes were to come to pass, the only way that I could do that would be essentially with an inanimate object or with an object that I get to pull all the strings on, basically a puppet or a computer program that I wrote that has everything figured out in it, where I've decided on everything that's going to happen in the program beforehand. And that's people's conception. That's the, the best that they can understand. If I'm going to be in control of everything in a given environment, in a given context, that means that the other thing cannot have anything close to a, a will of its own. And so people look at this and they usually go one of two ways. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. It can't mean that. And they wind up, you know, either rejecting Christianity outright. Unfortunately, um, a while ago, I watched uh, at least part of a, a video about uh, a lady who went, uh, left the Westboro Baptist Church because they were really big on the, the teaching of the sovereignty of God, that God has a purpose for everything. He creates everything for a purpose and his purposes will not be thwarted. And she's sitting there going, well... That means that God is responsible for sending people to hell. And of course, in Calvinist eh, theology, everyone starts out destined for hell. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's actually the same with Armenianism, Southern Baptist traditionalism, and um, Calvinism. That one's not different for any of them. Um, but she didn't like the idea of God being in control of it, because to her it's the, it's the puppet master thing. And so she just left Christianity entirely. Or if people stay within biblical historical Christianity, what they do is they look at verses like this and they say, well, it can't really mean that. It just means that God is going to make sure that the wicked people are duly punished. Of course, that kind of ignores the first part where it says he made it for its purpose, including the wicked for the day of evil. Um, but they basically try to reinterpret it, and there's kind of this cognitive distance that goes on where they don't really want to deal with what it says. And they usually wind up becoming either Southern Baptist traditionalists or Armenians or something along those lines. And then, on a very unbalanced side of it, you get the hyper-Calvinists who say, well, the only way that I could be in control of something is basically if that something was a puppet, and if God is in total control of me, that must mean I'm a puppet. Okay, then. It doesn't matter what I do or how I do it, because God is going to make it happen his way. Doesn't matter. No significant choices. And why? Because we're stuck with that idea that if you're sovereignly in control of something, that means that that thing has no real will of its own. But here's the weird thing about it. Of course, this isn't the only scripture on the matter, just like the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity doesn't just say that God is uh, one being or just that God is three persons. It says both. And in this case, we have a direct affirmation that God is sovereign. But that's not the only thing that Scripture says. Instead, Scripture teaches what is called compatibilism. That is, that God has a sovereign will um, he has created everything for a purpose, and all of his purposes are going to be worked out. But 
Mankind also has a will that operates with inside of that purpose, but he still has a real meaningful will. And you say, how does that make sense? Well, how does the doctrine of the Trinity make sense? One being three persons, that's outside of your experience, isn't it? You can't comprehend what that means. You can see that it's taught in the Bible, and you can subject yourself to it, saying, okay, that's what the Bible teaches, so I'm going to be subject to that and allow God to speak as it is and accept him as he describes himself. Same thing here. Okay, God is sovereign. He's made everything for a purpose, even the wicked for their day of evil, for their day of destruction, for their day of doom. But there's other passages in the Bible, and this is the passages that most of the Armenians and the Southern Baptist traditionalists know very well, that talk about the facts that mankind makes decisions. But it's always in the context of, uh, well, within the broader biblical context of the sovereignty of God. Both are at play. And what compatibilism teaches is that the will of man and the will of God are compatible. God doesn't have to do violence to the human will. And you can read that in the Great Creeds and Confessions. God does no violence to the human will. The will of man and the will of God mesh up. He doesn't have to uh, do any violence to their will. He does not have to um, do anything to ch fundamentally change who a person is um, as far as their decision-making process, their mind is concerned. He does change their nature, and we've talked about that, but he doesn't change their mind, as it were, their decision-making process. He created that decision-making process, and he didn't get it wrong. Okay, he's the one who created your mind. He, and it will never make a decision that he didn't create it to make. He is also the one who created the environment in which that mind operates. And he is the one who has the ability to intervene in that environment as he sees fit. But you are still going to be making real choices while all that is happening. And you still have real responsibilities in making those choices. That's what compatibilism teaches. Is it a mystery? Yes. But it's the mystery that the Bible affords. Let's take a look at a few uh, more germane passages that deal uh, with the sovereignty of God. Most of the people who will be listening to this who are on the other side already know all of the other passages that talk about the choices that man has and the responsibility that man has in it. Let's make sure that the other side gets represented here. So we've already looked at Proverbs 16.4. And let's go ahead and do a quick look at one of them that is alongside this. Romans 8.28. Uh, what does it say? It says, And we know that God causes all things all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Again, he is causing all things to work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Everything is done with a purpose. Okay, now, does that mean that the intermediate stages are going to be great? No, and we're going to talk about some of those people who encountered some intermediate stages that weren't so great. But we know that he is working to things to the eventual good of those who love God. That's us having our will. Okay, Our will is involved in that, and our will is meaningful. We do have real love towards God. Okay, For those of us who really do love God, and yes, it's going to be prompted by him putting his spirit in us to draw us to him, but we are still going to have a real love for God. But the other side of that is that those who have the real love of God are the ones that he has called. Okay. Well, why do we love God? Because he called us to that purpose. Okay. Compatibilism. We have a will. It's a creaturely will. It is bound by our nature. It is bound by the mind that God gave us, the decision-making uh, process that he put in us. It's bound by the environment that he manipulates, so on and so forth. It's, it's a creaturely will. And then there's the sovereign will, and the two perfectly mesh together. That's what scripture teaches. We're not sure exactly how it works. Just like we, we cannot conceive of a being that is one being and yet three persons uh, simultaneously, all at the same uh, time. Um, it's outside of our experience. And it's also outside of our experience for us to be sovereign over uh, something without that thing having no real will.
But what scripture teaches is that you will have real responses to God. They will be within the context of being a created thing, but you are going to have real responses. And God is really going to be in control, and he is really going to work things to his purpose. All right, let's look at another one. Daniel. And let's look at 4, 34 through 35. All right, this is a fairly famous statement from King Nebuchadnezzar after he had gone through a period of basically being turned into a wild animal because uh, he got cocky and said, I have done all of these things. And God said, no, no, I've done all these things. And turned Nebuchadnezzar into a beast, more or less, um, took on the attributes of a beast, I guess I should say. And then at the end of it, this is what Nebuchadnezzar had to say for himself. He said, but at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So here we see a real active uh, part on the part of Nebuchadnezzar. He had been punished for what he did wrong, and he raised his own eyes to heaven. There was a real part of him where he's saying, I messed up and I realize it. But notice also what he goes on to say. He says, speaking of God, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? So he makes a real decision on his part to look to the God of heaven. But at the same time, he realizes that this God of heaven is going to do his will in heaven and on earth. Okay. Both of them side by side. God is sovereignly going to accomplish his will. Mankind is making real, meaningful decisions along the way, and they're entirely compatible. They mesh up. Okay. God does not have to do any violence uh, to the human will. Okay. He knows you. He made you. He knows exactly what you need at a given point to make a given decision. Okay. And what that means is that when he's called someone, he knows exactly how to reach them. Okay. Totally in control. All right, let's look at another fairly famous one. Trope 1. 20 through 22. This is another fairly famous uh, point in the Bible. We have the account of Job. Job was a rather unfortunate guy in history. Um, a lot of bad things happened to him. And God allowed it. Satan came and asked God, Hey, let me prove that Job isn't really faithful to you. And God says, Okay, you can have him. Here's what you can and cannot do to him. Have at it. And this you have, and this deals with the problem of evil in the world. Every evil in the world exists because God allowed it to happen, but that doesn't mean he's the one who's perpetrating evil itself. It's Satan who did the evil things to Job. But God is still the ultimate cause of them. It's still under his sovereignty in as much as he's the one who gave the permission and set the boundaries. And Job realizes this. God is ultimately in control of this situation. It doesn't mean that it's not frustrating. It doesn't mean that Job didn't have a lot of frustration in this. But he recognizes that God is still in control and nothing that is happening is outside of his control. He, uh, this is what the text says. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? The Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. He, this is what Job understood. Job understood. 
God is not necessarily the one who is directly doing this, but God is still responsible for it. He has taken away. The only reason why this happened is because God allowed it to happen. And Job was okay with that. It's God's world. He gets to choose what happens. And he also realizes his place in the world. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. What's he saying? I'm nothing in the grand scheme of things. This is the biblical viewpoint. We are we're criminals on death row. That's what uh, the Bible says, is it not? The wages of sin is death and all of us are going to die. What does that mean? It means we're all criminals awaiting punishment. And God can choose to mete out that punishment however he wants, whenever he wants, and through whatever means he wants. The criminal doesn't get to say whether or not the punishment is just or not. The criminal isn't in a place to talk back to God in that regard. But that doesn't mean that God isn't right in what he's doing. And that is what separates someone that God has given a light to. A light to see their own filthiness. A light to see their own unworthiness. And when something bad happens, they realize, I didn't deserve any better than this. And that's exactly what you have with Job. Something bad happens and he says, well, I certainly don't like it, but it's not like I deserved any better either. That is a godly anthropology. Understanding that, yes, while humans have a real will, it is one that is still bound to sin and what happens in this earth is going to be a result, um, at least include results that stem from the fact that we are being punished for our sins temporally. And then there's also eternal punishment that awaits us. And that's where Christ comes into play. That's what Job understood. God gets to decide how to mete out temporal punishments and eternal ones. If, you know, I mean, there's the account, you know, back in the time of Moses of uh, Achan, you know, who steals and basically from what was supposed to be destroyed and the earth opens up and swallows him and his household. And, um, you know, most people that I know, Armenian and otherwise, they don't have a real problem with that. God was punishing evil. Well, we're all evil. None of us deserve anything better than what Job got. The reason why God allowed it to happen to Job instead of most of us, though, is because of how Job responded. Job had that light where he knew his place in the universe and he knew that it wasn't a good place. Lord gave something that I had no right to. He took it away. I didn't have any right to it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. At least I had it for the time. Wow. Wow. Most of us wouldn't do that, just being honest. That would not be the natural reaction for most of us. Now, getting to the point where we have that interaction of the human will and the divine will, let's take a look at Genesis uh, chapter 50, and we'll do verses 15 through 21. Okay, so this is um, when Joseph after Joseph had been sold into slavery into Egypt and eventually risen to power in Egypt, becoming second only to Pharaoh himself, you know, he winds up saving his brothers uh, from the famine that had gripped the, the surrounding lands and including Egypt, of course, as well. And um, this is after all of that. So let's go ahead and read what the text has to say. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for the wrong which we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. 
But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The key point right here is verse 20 of chapter 50. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You have the intention of both of them. The brothers were really acting uh, wickedly. They really wanted to see Joseph sold into slavery and never heard from again. Well, actually before that, they wanted to kill him. But God restrained them from that evil, pulled them <laughs> back, and through ordinary means, conviction on the part of one particular brother, said, you know, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Let's just sell him. So God restrained them in that regard, but they still had evil intentions. It was still wrong. And they were still acting out of their wills, even if one got a little convicted. But in this, God was still superseding the entire process to bring about this great salvation for these people, that they would be saved from this famine. And not just Joseph's brothers, not just his father, not just their associated family, but what Joseph was able to do in this situation wound up being a benefit to a lot of the people of Egypt and surrounding lands as well. All because his brothers were wicked. That is the thing. God uses the will of man. It doesn't mean that he has to do violence to the will of man, though, to do it. This is where you have both of them, and they're being put as being equally willful. Not necessarily equal in terms of who's in control. It's very obvious that the emphasis of control is on God, not on man here. But it says, but it uses the same terminology. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Both of them had an intention. Both of them meant to do something. And it was God's intention that prevailed. But the wills were real on both part, on both parts. And that's compatibilism. The Bible is very clear in teaching that God is sovereign. But it also teaches our responsibility time and time and time and time again. We make real decisions in real time. And there are real warnings in Scripture that we are to hold to, that we are to pay attention to, that we are to take in. How exactly does that work? How does God maintain sovereignty of everything? Remember Proverbs 16.4? God has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked person for the day of evil. How, does, uh, how is it that God is in control of everything and yet gives us a creaturely real will? Now, like I said, it's creaturely. It's bound by our created mind. It's bound by our nature. It's bound by our nature. And none of those kinds of uh, bindings apply to God. His mind is not a created mind. His, he has no environment that contains him. Every environment is within him. And he has no limitations on his nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of course, the wills are not anywhere near comparable, but they are both real wills. And this is what the Bible teaches. You have God's sovereign will, you have man's creaturely will, and the two exist side by side. That's the doctrine of compatibilism. And this is what prevents people from going off the rails on either side, where people look at the plain teaching of the sovereignty of God, and they say, I don't like that, and either they leave Christianity altogether, or they wind up you know, basically reinterpreting scripture, which is a really dangerous thing to do, trying to contort it around to their own view, or they wind up with like some of my hyper-Calvinist friends and less balanced Calvinist friends, where they say, well, the only way I can understand that is, you know, if I'm sovereign over something, it must be, you know, some kind of puppet, so I guess I'm God's puppet. Okay, then. doesn't matter what I'm going to do, because God's going to do. No, the, the balance is in between. God has a sovereign will of a creator, we have a subject, creaturely will, and the two are compatible. We have real will in real time that we'll be acting on. God has real will in real time, and he is going to accomplish his purposes even though we're really doing what we want to do. How does that work? I honestly don't know. Any more than I know 
how uh, someone can be one being and three persons. But that's what Bible teaches, so that's what I believe. Bible teaches that God is sovereign, and it also teaches my real capacity to make decisions and to heed warnings and these kinds of things, and so I do. It's what Scripture teaches, so that's what I believe. Now, just to reinforce the point a little bit here, let's go back and cover some of the other passages that talk about the sovereignty of God that we haven't quite hit yet. I want to be thorough here. So let's do Proverbs 16.1. It says, the plans of the heart belong to man, which is actually a really reassuring statement. The plans that you make are really your plans. You have real plans in your heart. You have real intention in your heart. Your will is your own. But what does it go on to say? But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. You are still going to do what God wants you to do. You're still going to say what God wants you to say. It's even though it's your own real will, everything that's done is still going to be according to God's purpose. How does that work? No. How is someone one being in three persons? It's the same uh, idea. God gets to define his own terms, and if he uh, finds himself thus, we have to accept him thus. Let's do Proverbs 16, 9. It says, The mind of man plans his way. You really do make real decisions with your own mind. But what does it say? The Lord directs his steps. Okay, good, bad, or indifferent. God is not going to let you step outside of his purposes. And that's actually a really reassuring thing. Not just, well, consider it. I mean, our own plans and our own way isn't exactly perfect all the time. And there are times where we will make real mistakes. Um... But it's not outside of God's control, and it's certainly not outside of God's redemption. It's not outside of God's purpose. Even when we fail, there is a purpose in that failure. Sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's simply so that everyone else can see. Sometimes it might simply be for a good laugh. Okay, God does have a sense of humor. I firmly believe that. He made me after all. But even though our own plans are imperfect, and even though they might fail miserably, God is still directing the steps. God still has a purpose. And that also applies to the wicked person. And frankly, all of us are wicked. Um, but I would say the person who, who does not uh, bow the knee to God, uh, that kind of uh, person, same thing. They're going to make all of these plans, and they will do wicked, evil things, sadly. There will be rape, there will be murder, there will be genocide. There will be things as maybe as small as blowing someone off when you made an agreement to meet them. All kinds of evil things that people do to each other. But God still has a purpose in all of them. He is still directing all of them towards the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. How does that work? I honestly do not know. How can someone be one being and three persons? It's what scripture teaches, side by side, very frequently. Right, let's go to Proverbs 16.33. It says, the law is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Okay. God is in control of the flip of the coin, the roll of the dice. There is nothing that happens as a so-called random event it is truly random. It's every decision is from the Lord. Not just known to the Lord, but is from the Lord. And if God has the ability to control even something so seemingly insignificant as the roll of a dice, flip of a coin, then doesn't it stand to reason that if he can control all of the components, that he's also controlling the outcome of the whole as well? One kind of necessitates the other. If you can control all of the components... You control the whole thing, don't you? Let's look at Proverbs 19.21. seems that Solomon, the author attributed to Proverbs, uh, re <clears throat> reputed for being the, the wisest man alive, seemed to know a whole lot about this. Um, many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. 
Which plan is it that you're going to choose? The one that God wants you to. Remember, for example, back in the lifetime of David, um, David, one of David's sons rebels against him. And the son has the opportunity of listening to multiple advisors. And the advice that is given to him is confounded. And it's said so in scripture, that the wise counsel that is normally given was confounded and bad advice was taken. That the, uh, that the wisdom that somebody normally would have given wasn't given. And similar instances uh, occurred after the time of Solomon and the, and the time of his son, uh, where the kingdom split. Um, God wanted that split to happen. And so he caused that Solomon's son would listen to the advice of his peers rather than the advice of his elders. Now, does that mean that the son didn't want to listen to his sons, but really wanted to listen to the elders? No, you read the story, and it's really clear that, you know, he liked hanging out with his friends and thought that his same age friends were just so smart. He had real intention, you know, really thinking that these young people are smart and those old people are just, you know, dumb. They're not with the times. But the text at the same time says that this was God's intention. This was God's purpose. You have the sovereign will of God. You have the real but creaturely intention of man, and they're entirely compatible in the Bible. God is really working out his purposes. Man is making real decisions in real time as a creature. Throughout the Bible. Let's go to uh, 2024. Man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his way? Do you know the outcome of your life? Do you know what's going to happen from the decisions that you make? No. Nope. But they are ordained of God. And we know that he has a purpose. Proverbs 16.4, Romans 8.28. He has a purpose in everything he does, including the steps you take. This is the great God that we have. Somehow he's sovereign without doing violence to our wills. That's what scripture clearly teaches. I don't know how it works, but that's what scripture clearly teaches. Just as clearly as the Bible teaches that God is one being and three persons. And this is the thing that Leighton Flowers doesn't deal with. I don't think he's even honestly capable of dealing with this. Okay. He is dealing with those Calvinists that I talked about that don't really go this way, that kind of go the other way. Well, the only way I can conceive of someone being sovereign is if the thing is a puppet, so I guess I'm a puppet. And they dogmatically defend puppethood. And I would agree with Professor Leighton Flowers that that is a very dangerous view to take. It's a very dangerous uh, perspective to have. But that doesn't mean that what he has to say regarding Tulip is accurate, though. And that's why I'm responding to this. He's not dealing with the full Reformed faith that teaches compatibilism and deals with all of these other things. He's dealing with a very particular subset that frankly can be dangerous. I agree with him on that one. If you have someone who's just a five-point Calvinist not, and not a compatibilist, um, who doesn't understand the broader scope of these things, it's a very dangerous thing. If you have someone who assumes, hey, Bible says God's sovereign, so I must be a robot. And they're dogmatically defending robothood. Yeah, you're going to have all kinds of problems. I agree with Leighton Flowers on that one. But that is not an excuse for handling the word of God poorly. And that's what I see Leighton Flowers doing in this. Okay, so first of all, he didn't define unconditional election from a Calvinistic point of view, so I had to do that. And then, like I said, there's this underlying issue of God's sovereignty and man's will, and it turns out that in the Bible, they're compatible. And he doesn't deal with that either. This is, you know, the <laughs> just simply not dealing with the fullness that is out there. And to a certain extent, I understand why, because he's dealing with a lot of those really unbalanced Calvinists who only have the five points, who don't really think about things like compatibilism and all the other doctrines that pertain to it. So I get why he's doing that to a certain extent, but be really nice if he did deal with it so that we could have the full revelation of God on the table. All right, moving on. Uh, 
I'll give you an illustration to help you understand this. I think the best way that I can explain it. Matthew chapter 22 gives a parable. Jesus gives a parable. And it's called the wedding banquet parable. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Well, you know the story. The king has a kingdom. He has a nation. And out of that nation, he chooses a group of people called his servants. And his son's getting married. And so he has a wedding banquet. And so what does he do? He has his servants send out invitations. Did you get the picture here? So he says, hey, servants, I want you to go hand these invitations to the people in my kingdom and invite them to this wedding banquet. That's a choice he's made. So notice the choices so far. The kingdom, they, he, he's a king over this nation. He's chosen that nation. And that's an unconditional choice, by the way. Did you notice that? The king is not choosing the nation that he chooses because the nation is better than any other nation. As a matter of fact, we know of Israel, which is reflecting of Israel, by the way. Israel was a really small nation and had a lot of problems. And the Bible is really clear that he did not choose that nation because it was better than others. If anything, he chose it because it's not as good as others. God does that. Have you ever noticed that he chooses the Davids instead of the bigger brothers? He chooses the Gideon's army that's smaller versus the one that's bigger. Why? Because his glory is made known when he accomplishes a purpose through weak versus strong vessels. Make sense? So the king has chosen a nation, and he's done so unconditionally. But he's also chosen servants out of that nation. Now, those are individuals, because Calvinists are real big. It's, about, it's not corporate election. It's not just about choosing a nation. He chooses individuals. I agree. That's the servants. He chooses one prophet over another prophet. He chooses Elijah, but not Elijah's next-door neighbor. Does Elijah deserve to be a prophet more than the next-door neighbor? No. Does Paul deserve to be chosen to be an apostle over the next guy, the Pharisee standing next to him when they stoned Stephen? No, Paul didn't deserve it. He was stoning Christians. He didn't deserve anything. So God unconditionally elects, chooses, not only his nation, but people from that nation to accomplish a purpose through them. So you're, okay, Leighton, you sound like you're, you're believing unconditional election. Well, the parable's not over. He goes on, and he says, I want you to take this, this message in an invitation. I want you to take it to the Israelites first. I want you to take it to my people first. And what does he do? They go out and they take it to the people. What do the people do to the messengers? They try to kill them, right? It makes the king mad. He brings his messengers back in. He says, well, fine. If you, my own are going to reject this message, this invitation, then I want you to take this message to the highways and the byways, to the good and the bad. Like, no matter how moral they are, no matter how clean they are, no matter how much money they have, I want you to take it to whosoever will come. Anybody. Third choice already. Choice of the nation, choice of the servants, and choice of the people he's going to go take the message to. And again, the, the choice he made is unconditional. He says, go send it to anybody. I don't care who they are. Send the message to everybody. So, so far, we have three elections of God, all of which are completely unconditional choices of God. So you're going, well, Leighton, you're a Calvinist then, because you obviously believe in unconditional election. We haven't even got to the third one, fourth one yet. Okay, so there's more choices. Keep going in the parable, because remember how the parable ends? Many are called, and what? Few are chosen. We've got to the called part so far. That's all we've talked about. We've talked about the three choices, unconditional choices of God, in order to bring redemption to the world, in order to make a call, to call all nations to himself, that's the unconditional election portion of this process. Now, what about the fourth choice in the parable? What happens? Those who show up clothed in right wedding garments, he allows them to enter. The rest, he, he shuts out, right? Sounds like a condition to me. The condition is you have to be clothed in the right garments. If you are not clothed in the right garments, you're not getting in. What does being clothed in the right garments represent? Well, salvation through faith in Christ. When you believe in Christ, you are clothed with his righteousness so that God doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of his son. And so what he's talking about is that no one's getting in unless they are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which is a condition. And therefore he can say, many are called, few are chosen. And the ones who are chosen are chosen based upon if they believe in the one the true begotten Son of Jesus Christ and clothed in his righteousness. Does that make sense? So we can say... I can okay. Um, I let him go on for there just so that he could have, you know, the, the full time to represent his perspective on this. And this is where he's basically unpacking his view of corporate election. Instead of um, unconditional election, he has a view of corporate election. And again, this is where he goes to the text of the Bible and doesn't handle it in necessarily the best way. And for those of you who've been paying careful attention so far, you probably already know the major error that he's committing here. Oh, actually, there's two. But one of the most obvious errors that he's committing here is the parable error. That is, focusing on the details of a parable and trying to draw core doctrine and theology from those. Okay, this is a parable. Parables only have one core meaning. That's been very well established in history. If you go aside from that, you wind up with all kinds of problems, very dangerous problems. And on top of that, and on top of trying to focus in on the details of parables and draw theology from that, he's also committing the error of avoidance. Because there are passages in Scripture that deal directly 
with this particular issue of how God's election works in terms of salvation. We've already talked about passages like that, Acts 13, uh, 48, um, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, that says that the belief that we have, as well as the grace and salvation that we receive in Christ, are all gifts of God. They are all the gift of God, it, uh, is the way that it puts it. Okay, there are passages that speak to this, but he avoids dealing with any of those, and instead he goes to a parable. So, we're going to have to deal with the parable and see exactly what he's doing in interpreting it. So he's already stated, you know, this is the the wedding parable. The king is over a kingdom. God chooses the kingdom. He sends out uh, servants. He chooses the servants. And um, he chooses who the invitation is going to go to. And then the requirement for getting in once you've uh, had all that is that you have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And superficially, it sounds pretty good. Let's see here if it'll bring up two chapters. Yeah, it brings up two chapters. Perfect. All right, so brought up the parable here, and we're going to go ahead and go through it, taking a little bit more attention to context, and then also seeing if his interpretation really works out in practicality. So let's go ahead and begin in the previous chapter so we get a little bit more context here. We'll go back to verse 42 of chapter 21, and we'll start there before we get into the parable. Jesus said to them, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. So what's the context here? Jesus is speaking parables against the Pharisees. Very much so directly what it says. And it's talking about a, a transition from these people to people who will be accepting it. Okay. And it specifically puts that in terms of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is being taken from you, and it's going to be moved to another people. All right, and with that background, we go into uh, the parable of the marriage feast, or the wedding banquet, however you want to say it. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been inviting to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Now, this is more of a technical point, but it is still a point where Leighton Flowers got this wrong. The parable does not begin with the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is simply just assumed in it. It doesn't say that he chose the kingdom. Instead, the first uh, thing that we have that's actually chosen at all, there is no choice of kingdom, and there actually is no choice of slaves here. It just says he sent out his slaves. That's not the focus of the parable. Okay. The only thing that comes close to being uh, a choice is those who have been invited, the first group of people who are invited. And it decides to have them come in. That's about as close to a decision as you get. So there is no elect uh, uh, election in terms of the kingdom here. The kingdom is just simply assumed, and it includes everyone in the, the story. He is the king of everything. Um, and there was one group of people who were initially invited to the, the wedding banquets. And from the preceding passage, we get the idea that this is the Israelites. And um, this parable seems to be directly in con, uh, uh, directly relevant to the Pharisees, especially. Okay, so these are the people who were first invited, the Israelites in general, especially the Pharisees. And... So they're going to be brought in. That seems to be the most direct application. And so he's, uh, and they were unwilling to come. 
Okay. So these people were not willing to come in. And like I said before, compatibilism. You have a real will. God is going to give you op real options, and you are going to make real decisions on them. But that doesn't mean that God's purposes could ever be thwarted in them. God is still sovereign. God is still going to work his will in them. Okay. And again, he sent out other slaves saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. So there's multiple opportunities that are given. Okay. <laughs> you messed up the first time in responding to this. But let's try again here. Let's see how just how stupid you are. And what is it going to say? It says, but they paid no attention and went their way. One to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Well, that actually makes things really interesting, doesn't it? I mean, if we wanted to press on the details here, and I'm not saying that you necessarily should, but if we're going to do what Leighton Flowers is doing and pressing on the details here, it's talking about people who went on their own way, went to his own farm, another's to his business, and it goes on to say the rest uh, seized his slaves and mistreated and killed them. Is that really indicative of the nation of Israel anymore? Or is this just indicative of people in general who would have would reject uh, the word of God. Um, those who have their own uh, business to attend to, their own worries and concerns, or those who would be, excuse me, <coughs> I apologize. I was kind of holding that one in for a while. Um, but is this something that you can necessarily press on being the Israelites particularly? In the context of the parable, you actually couldn't make that. The only reason why we would associate that with the Israelite nation is because of the context, which Leighton Flowers left out. But if I wanted to be, you know, stubborn and mean, I could limit it just to the context that he mentioned and say, well, in the context itself, it's not talking about um, Israel. It's talking about people in general who would ignore the kingdom of God and would turn away from it. You could make that assessment if you're looking at just a parable alone without context. But because of the context, I would agree with Leighton Flowers that this parable has to do with Israel rejecting uh, the kingdom of God. Particularly uh, the Pharisees, it's what they're most directed at. But this is the emphasis because of the context. Okay, so... Uh, there is no overt choice that's being given there, but there is one group of people that were first invited, and they rejected it. Some of them uh, passively, some of them actively, but all of them wound up rejecting it. Uh, and so in verse 7 it says, But the king was enraged, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. All right, now does this... Um, this is kind of an interesting part because this actually did happen in history, and this has to do with the prediction that was just given. Um, you know, and he who falls on this throne will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Um, that actually happened when the, the temple uh, was destroyed in AD 70. The um, temple, part of the temple actually landed on a, a group of people that were standing under it, and they were crushed to be seen no more. Um, that actually physically happened. And so this, in, in this particular context, isn't, um, as far as the destruction and the rejection of the previous people, is not so much an, an eternal judgment, it has that implication, but not directly. Directly, it would be about physical destruction, which is definitely interesting that way. Um, but again, that's a detail to press on. Is that the overall point? Well, let's see. Then he said to his slaves, uh, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding, fe uh, wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Okay, so in this we still have... No election of the servants. The servants are just there. We have no selection of the kingdom. It's just assumed. 
all we have is one group of people that were invited who rejected and another group of people being invited instead, the former having been destroyed for their rejection. That doesn't really sound like what Leighton Flowers is trying to paint here. It doesn't sound like that at all. The straightforward meaning so far is that this Israel was invited, Israel rejected, like we said uh, before. Men have real wills that they will execute in real time. It doesn't mean that the purposes of God are going to be thwarted. It doesn't mean that he's not sovereign, but they are making a real rejection at that time, and God is dealing with them accordingly for that real rejection. And there's going to be that outcome, and one of the outcomes is that it is going to be opened up to another set of people. There's nothing really on that one that has to do with corporate election. This is just what God is doing in history. Um, the purpose of this parable so far has nothing to do with teaching on election. It has everything to do with Jesus saying, this is what's going to happen in history because of uh, your guys' choices and decisions. This is what God is going to do with you guys, that kind of thing. But this is not a parable that is about election, corporate or otherwise, in and of itself. But let's go ahead and read on. Verse 11. But when the king came to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So, so far, we haven't had really anything that is in terms of election, per se. We do have, you know, mankind making real decisions, being punished for those real decisions, um, the invitation going out to all, those kinds of things. But as far as it actually deals with the doctrine of election, this actually doesn't directly apply to it in any substantial way. And then when we get to the end here, um, we deal with someone who has come to the wedding banquet, who has been inv invited into the, the kingdom of God, as it were, metaphorically speaking, and he doesn't have on wedding clothes. And Leighton Flower says, well, this is you know a sign that you know he rejected the, the righteousness of Christ. There's this condition. You know, you have to accept the righteousness of Christ. And like we said, there are passages that deal with that. If you're going to accept the righteousness of Christ, what comes before that? Well, Ephesians 2.8 says that if you come to faith in Christ, it's because of the gift of God. Acts 13.48 says that people who believe the word of God were appointed to do so. Okay, this passage doesn't have anything to do with that. But what I find really interesting here is that Leighton Flowers doesn't pick up on one of the most obvious facts. This is obviously someone who accepted the invitation. Okay, so the servants, they go out into the highways and the byways, and they compel people to come in, and a bunch of people come in. And here's this guy who's obviously accepted the invitation, but he's not dressed in the wedding garments. This reminds me of something else that Jesus said back in uh, Matthew chapter 7. And some of you may already know where I'm going. Matthew chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Why does this passage remind me? Why do I see a correlation between the two? Because you have people who think that they should be allowed into the kingdom of God. Or in this case, people who think that they should be allowed into the wedding feast. But... The question is, do they really belong there? In the case of Matthew chapter 7, these are people who are saying, hey, didn't we do all of these really cool religious things? I mean, we, we preached in your name. We drove out demons. I mean, we are, we are hip people. We were doing the, the godly things. And in this case, you say, 
Well, the guy accepted the invitation, obviously. He came, but he didn't have on the wedding garments. In either case, you have people who think that they belong, but really don't. In one case, Jesus says, Away from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. And in this case, you have bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, is there going to be a human component to this? Oh, very much so. Um, in the context of you know the ancient world, when it comes to these kinds of wedding feasts, it was always the responsibility of the person who was giving the feast to provide for the needs of the guest, and that would, of course, include the wedding clothes. And you can see instances of that going all the way back to, say, Judges 14 with Samson and uh, the wedding uh, that he had prepared for himself. He never actually wound up going through with it, but he had prepared, and the expectation was that he was the one who was going to provide clothing for the companions uh, that was given to him, and that went south real quick. Um, but it's always understood in ancient cultures that either the person or the group, and in Israel, Israeli history throughout time, it kind of developed more into the group, into the family. Uh, the family or the group that is throwing the party is the one who's responsible for providing for the needs of the guest, and especially the wedding clothes. So that means that this person either tried to sneak into the party, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because this is an open invitation party. That's like saying, I'm going to go crash the party that everyone was invited to. You don't do that. That's just dumb. Okay, You can't crash a party that everyone's invited to. So that supposition doesn't work. So, so the other option is that um, for whatever reason, he didn't receive the wedding clothes that were would have been provided um, either because the, the servants rejected him or because he just simply bypassed that part in the line, whatever the case happens to be, but he didn't do that part. And again, we go to other passages to talk about why he didn't do that part. It would be because he's not elect. Okay, Ephesians 2a, Acts 13.48, passages like that. We've already talked about all that. Um, but what's interesting here is that what Jesus is basically teaching is that there will be people who accept the invitation who still won't really belong there, and their heart will not really be in it. This guy evidently wanted the food, but he didn't want to be uh, fully participate in uh, the wedding itself. I love the wedding banquet food, I just don't want to go to the wedding. I'm not so excited about that part. And this has to deal with a doctrine that, and I think this is the main reason why Leighton Flowers didn't pick up on this at all, is because this has to deal with the doctrine of false conversion, which Dr. Leighton Flowers doesn't really appear to have. He's traditional Southern Baptist, he's once saved, always saved. So for him, it doesn't make sense to have someone who accepts the invitation who yet gets thrown out. So he doesn't even bring up that this person obviously accepted the invitation. But in a fully orbed um, Calvinistic Reformed faith, though, I'm talking about full, uh, fully, uh, a fully developed system, you know, like you get in the creeds and confessions and things like that, um, you do have false conversion. And you do have people, like I talked about before, who are going to say yes to Christ because... They want the benefits. I don't want to go to hell. Hey, you promised me my best life. Now I will go for it. And guess what? They're going to think that they belong there. But they're not going to be there because they've taken on the attributes of God. They're not going to be there because they really hate their sin and have come to the only one who can purify them of that sin. Okay, that is ultimately, in a lot of ways, what defines a Christian. This is how you know them. Back in uh, Matthew chapter 7, I believe it is, well, somewhere between 5 and 7, but I think it's in 7, Jesus talks about how you know them. He says that you will know them by their fruit. And the fruit that we produce as Christians is repentance. Okay, Not only do we have faith, but that faith is accompanied by repentance, by a turning away from sin, a hatred for sin. It's not to say that we're going to be perfect in this life, but that those who are truly called of God are not just going to come to God for the benefits here and there, but they're actually going to take on the attitude of God where they want to fully participate in who he is to include his holiness. And that's not what you see here. You see someone who does not want the wedding clothes, who does not want to fully participate in this wedding feast. They like the feast part of it, but the fact that you're there for a wedding, 
It seems to go right by him, doesn't it? And like we said, it doesn't say whether or not the, the servants did, simply didn't give him the clothes or he rejected them. Either one is a possibility within the Calvinistic framework. But in either case, it shows that this guy is not producing the fruits that are in keeping with real intention towards this end. Yes, he accepted the invitation. Great, fine, wonderful. But does that mean he was really there for the right reasons? No. And in terms of Christianity, us coming to God for the right reasons means that not only are we having faith, you know, this mental ascent, yes, Lord, I believe that you can save me. Please save me. I put my faith in you. It's not just that. It's going to be accompanied by repentance, a turning away from sin, a hatred for sin. It's not going to say that we're going to be perfect. But in our life, we're going to be looking at our sin and hating it and making real significant strives in that uh, regard that God enables us to do. God will enable us to become more holy as we live. It's not to say that we're going to be perfect but that we are ever going to be uh, ever striving to be like the God to whom we are being reconciled. But how does that happen? How do you get to the point where not only do you want to get into the wedding banquet, but you actually want to fully participate in it? Where not only do you want to be freed of hell, not only do you want your best life now, not only do you want all of the benefits that come along with Christianity, but you're willing to accept even the bad things because you are taking on the attributes of God. You care about what God cares about. You care about the holiness of God and the glory of God. And your life starts reflecting that. You start living a life of repentance where the things you once did, you start hating. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful every time, but you hate them and you make real strides against those things. Your life fundamentally changes. The things that once gave you pleasure and joy now become dead to you. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to fall back into them from time to time. But there's going to be a real change in your nature. Because of what? Because you simply made a decision. Well, I'm going to decide I want to go to the wedding banquet and fully participate. Well, we already said that faith is a gift of God. That's what Ephesians 2.8 teaches. And that if you believe, it's because of the appointment of God. X, uh, 1348. But what we're dealing with here is that full participation, producing the fruit, repentance. Turns out that scripture is pretty clear about that one too. How is it that we come to repent? Well, the Apostle Paul deals with that somewhat tangentially when he's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. So Paul is speaking to Timothy and he says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. He's giving instructions to him. Okay, this is how you're supposed to act. This is how people who would fill your office are supposed to act. It says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. What is it that causes repentance? God's gift. God grants repentance. It is another one of those gifts. So, grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Faith is a gift. And even repentance is something that is granted by God. It's a gift of God. That's what scripture clearly teaches. Okay, so how does that relate to this parable? Well, it's a parable. It's not necessarily meant to be talking about what is going on inside of a person that would produce these outward effects. Um, but the parable does uh, indeed relate to that real will that people have of rejecting God in the case of the Israelites at the time of Israel. And the real a phenomenon that happens where people, you know, and make this mental ascent that they're part of God's kingdom without really wanting to be a part of God's kingdom, without really wanting uh, to be rid of their sin, without real repentance in their lives, so on and so forth. The parable deals with all of that, true. But the fact of the matter is that it doesn't deal with what is behind all of that, why those happen. Other passages, however, do. 
So he's going to a parable to avoid these other passages that say these things, that say that faith is a gift of God, that say that repentance, that actually wanting to be a full member of that wedding banquet, to really participate in it, not just get the benefits of the feast, but really fully participate in it, even that, that turning away from what you once were and turning towards the things of God, even that is a gift. And... Leighton Flowers completely skips over all of that. Okay, in favor of this parable that he's reinterpreted to mean corporate election. And he says, it's the kingdom. Well, the kingdom is never mentioned as being elected in the parable. It's just assumed that the kingdom is there. But you do have different groups of invited people. You have one group of people that is invited at first, and not everybody else. Then everybody else is included. And God chooses which one it is. I agree with that. And the servants, well, the servants aren't really mentioned as being elected. They're just there, and they're told what to do. Um, but I did want to bring up one thing that I found really interesting in uh, Leighton Flowers' presentation. He said, you know, God unconditionally chooses the servants, which to me seems just really weird if these servants are, you know, chosen for servanthood, but yet salvation is still an individual choice, which is what he winds up saying. You have to choose to put on the garments, which is true to an extent. You will have a real choice in putting on the garment or not. The question is, what's behind that choice? And what's behind that choice is the gift of God. Um, but still, you will make a real choice to that. But he says that becoming a servant of God is unconditional, and I would agree with that. But to me, it seems really inconsistent if he's going to say that being a servant of God is unconditional, but being in the kingdom is conditional. I mean, look at the, the servants of God. You have um, Paul, for example, who is told that he is going to be uh, Christ's servant, that he's going to meet uh, means by which he speaks uh, to the people of Israel and to uh, the Gentiles. And this is what he's told before he's told to repent and believe. Just look at Acts, so what is that, Acts 22, where Paul retells the story of his conversion, and he goes through what happens with Ananias, and that's actually where he's told to you know repent and be baptized and those kinds of things is after Jesus says, you are my servant. It seems like uh, not only was the call to servanthood unconditional there, but if you're going to make someone a servant unconditionally, um, they're going to be a part of the kingdom uncon unconditionally too. That is kind of logically prior, isn't it? And then uh, take Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah, oh, let's just go there real quick. Jeremiah, do, 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 do. go all the way back to the beginning. Jeremiah 1. And verse 5, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So before you were even born, I decided that you were going to be a prophet. Well, if it's conditional, as Leighton Flowers says, couldn't um, Jeremiah have said, You know what? I don't really even want to be a part of your kingdom, God. I don't really want to be... Um, someone that you would take in. Would that have thwarted the servanthood? No. Because God says he decided that beforehand. And so if he's taking him in, it, it's logically prior that he would also have to be taking into him, not just as a servant, but into the kingdom as well, into the kingdom of God. I mean, not just into Israel, but as one of his chosen ones, one of the elect, one of God's people in the proper sense of uh, eternal salvation. It doesn't make sense to say, well, the servants are unconditionally chosen, but not their salvation. But yet, the uh, text is real clear, these people are going to be my servants no matter what. But yet you say that you can choose whether or not you're going to be saved regardless of God's intention. That doesn't work. There's a huge inconsistency in a Leighton Flowers explanation. You can definitely be a servant without definitely being saved. And granted, God uses people, you know, God uses means we're all servants in that sense. But having been a, a servant in that sense, where God is specifically using them to convey his message and those kinds of things, that doesn't really seem very reasonable. But that's um, 
That's Leighton Flowers on that one. And like I said, it doesn't seem overly consistent, but that's what he does. All right, let's go ahead and finish this. Commission election, and we can actually agree with the Calvinists on some aspects of that. But we don't agree with them all the way because we don't believe that God unconditionally elects that certain people will be clothed and some people won't, and they don't have any option in the, in the process. Does that make sense? And you can see why that gets really confusing, especially when you come to Romans 9 and other passages, which Paul is talking about all the different choices of God to bring election about through Israel, and he's talking about Israel in that passage, but he's also talking about the individuals chosen from Israel, and he's talking about the people who believe in that message, and that's all in one chapter. You can see how you'd walk away and you'd go, okay, that, I'm confused, and I don't know what that means. Maybe the Calvinistic answer is the right one, and you can come up with that conclusion, and that's one of the reasons I don't. So instead of unconditional election, I like the, the concept of unconditional corporate election, which I think better incorporates the concept of that he, he unconditionally selects Israel, people from Israel, and he, unelect, and he unconditionally elects to send that message um, to, to people of all races, all groups, all economic, social economic groups. He's, he's not partial in that way. He sends the message to everyone. So that's an unconditional corporate view of election versus um, the, the individual particular election where God is electing a particular group of people to, um, to certainly believe um, and the rest are left without hope of being able to do so. All right, so that ends uh, the section on unconditional election, which he really didn't define in the first place. And then when he goes through this explanation of uh, the wedding banquet parable, he is doing this um, without any idea of the idea of compatibilism that the Bible teaches. That God is sovereign, he's working his purposes, but you are still have real choices, your heart makes real plans, so on and so forth that the Bible talks about. Completely bypasses all of this stuff, so he takes all of these outward things that show up in the parable, and he tries to draw doctrine and theology from that. That's the parable error. And he avoids all those passages that say, why are people making these choices? Well, it's because of the gift of God. The faith that we have is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. Uh, when we respond to the word, that is because of the appointment of God, Acts 13.48. When we repent, not just when we make a mental assent that, hey, I want to be a part of this and accept the invitation in that sense, but when we actually want to be a full participating member in the kingdom of God, that repentance where we turn away from sin and fully take on the character of God just as much as we can in this uh, temporal life, that repentance that we have, turning away from the things of God, even that is granted to us. Second Timothy chapter 2, and what was that? Verses 24 through 26. Okay. All of those things are pertinent to it, and he avoids all of those, instead focuses on the parable, and draws things out from it that, you know, you could draw out that way if you wanted to. It's really hard to draw out the whole thing with the kingdom, though, because you, yeah, it's not really stated that way. And the servants aren't ever specifically chosen in the parable either. And he completely ignores the part where this is someone who accepted the invitation but was not in keeping with um, the purpose of the wedding feast as a whole. Like the feast part, but not necessarily the whole wedding garment thing, the whole wedding part. Um, completely bypass that. Why? I strongly suspect, uh, suspect because he is a traditional Southern Baptist. Once saved, always saved. The idea of someone accepting the invitation and not uh, getting in doesn't make a whole lot of sense to him. But from a reform perspective, it does. It's We say that, you know, it's not just people who make that a sense. Lord, Lord, as Jesus has said prior to this eh, parable, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. You actually have to want to be gods. And that repentance, not just the faith, but that repentance where you realize that you in and of yourself and your natural self are not of God, and you want to turn away from that, and you want to take on God's characteristics and God's standards, that is something that has to be granted to you. And Paul was really clear about that. So when you are you know, disputing with these people, eh, Timothy, uh, dispute them uh, with them in such a way that, of course, you're going to be um, gentle uh, with them so that God may grant them repentance. You have a part that you're responsible for, for being gentle with them. But... God is going to use that as a means. God is going to work his purposes through that and grant them repentance through what you're going to be doing. It's all attributed to God in one sense or the other, either, uh, either actively or passively. God passively let Satan do what he did to Job, but God was still the ultimate cause of it.
Um, but God actively intervenes sometimes, like like what he did with Paul. Show up on the road to Damascus. Hey, Paul, you're mine. Now go on to Damascus, and I'll give you further instructions there. You're going to be my servant. All of them are in the Bible. All of them are the teaching of the Bible. And the problem that I have with a lot of folks is they ignore that fact. Okay. And this is what Leighton Flowers is doing is he's trying. This is the, the contest that he has. The Bible teaches sovereignty, but it also teaches our real choice. And so instead of putting the two together, as the Bible presents it, compatibilism, he instead says, well, I'm not a puppet on strings. And that's the only way I can think of being totally sovereign. So what that means is God isn't totally sovereign over everything. So, you know, it must be kind of election. You know, God sovereignly does some things, but when it comes to our actual decision, you know, that's still left up to us. Well, what the Bible teaches is that it is left up to you, and it is still entirely God's doing. How does that work? I don't know, but that's what Scripture says. It says that we are responsible for our acceptance and rejection and those kinds of things, and also for all of our other would-be sins or would-be instances of keeping God's commandments. We're still responsible for them, but it also says that God is sovereign over them. Okay. How you have someone who's completely sovereign over another, and yet that other have still have a real will. It's a creaturely will, but still have a real will. That one really is a mystery, but that's the one that the Bible affords. So with that, let's go back to our theme verse for the section and get us out of here. Proverbs 16.4 The Lord has made everything for its own purpose even the wicked for the day of evil. God really is sovereign. And there are people who are truly evil and truly good, and they're going to do truly good and truly evil things, but God has a purpose in all of it for the good of those who are called by him, who love him, their own will is involved, and who are called according to his purpose. Okay. That's the solution to all of this. This is the contest that Leighton Flowers is having here. He doesn't want to be, you know, like these Calvinists that he's encountered that are just kind of off the rails. And so he's reacting to that, and I understand that. But the solution is right there in Scripture. It's compatibilism. We have a will. God has a will. God has a creator's will. We have a creature's will. And God is going to accomplish his purpose through the creature's will. That's what it is, folks. Thank you for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, which includes my Armenian friends, my Southern Baptist traditionalist friends, and of course, even my fellow really weird hyper-Calvinist friends, I pray that you would go with God and be blessed. But for those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.